Hello Thermo fans! Today let's talk a little bit more about ideal solutions and real solutions and why the real world does not happen to be ideal and what we can do about it. So today's problem of the day focuses on the concept of the real solution. And I realized to have a good conversation about what a real solution is, we should back up and talk a little bit about what the assumptions were built in to the ideal solution assumption. So recall, right now we're mostly thinking about phase equilibrium for mixtures, and when we are at phase equilibrium for a mixture, the fugacity of component A in the liquid is equal to its fugacity in the vapor. And notice there's a little hat drawn on top of those script Fs. And we need that little hat, especially uh, when we're talking about non-ideal solutions, because that little hat indicates that we're talking about how this behaves in the mixture. And when we talk about a real solution, as opposed to an ideal one, the behavior of the stuff may be different now that it's in a mixture. So let's consider how an ideal solution works. And to do that, I'm going to back up a step and remind us how ideal gas worked, because these things kind of build on each other. So thinking back to ideal gas, remember an ideal gas is composed of point particles that don't interact and bounce off the walls uh, elastically. And you recall also that we said the worst assumption about that was this whole non-interacting thing. And in fact, as long as we know that a gas is not going to condense or that we've got some other way to account for its condensation, we're usually pretty good with ideal gas, uh, as long as we're at low pressure where the density is relatively low. Uh, if we can't assume that, if things are going to interact or we want to leave the option for them to interact, we'll have to uh, model it in some other way. So let's now think about the idea of ideal solution. In an ideal solution, everything's interacting, right? We, if, to have something be a liquid, which ideal solution can describe, uh, we 100% need interactions. So it's, uh, we're assuming interactions, things are not point particles, um, but what we are assuming that is kind of non-realistic is what's called symmetrical reactions. Inter I mean, interactions, not reactions. And what we mean by symmetrical is, let's say molecule A is uh, these pink molecules that are on the screen, and they interact with themselves in some particular way with some particular strength. You know, they, when they encounter each other, they're attracted or repulsed in some way. And then we have molecule B, which is here in blue, and it interacts with other elements of molecule B, uh, in exactly that same way. Okay, so same strength of attraction or repulsion, whichever it is. And so when we put these two things together, their properties and their behavior uh, don't change because they're together. So that is the interaction of one B particle sitting there next to an A particle is exactly the same as if it were surrounded by others of its own molecular species. And so if we wanted to figure out some of the properties of this, um, we might be able to do so by some uh, weighted average. So for example, its volume, if you had 50% of this stuff and 50% of the other stuff, you put those two things together, its volume would just be the correct weighted average and there would be no enthalpy of mixing. So that's what an ideal solution is like, and that works really well if the molecules are extremely similar to each other, uh, and works much less well for every other case. So yeah, let's talk about how we work with that. Another, Another critical, critical element, element or, or a, a lens, lens through which we can uh, discover if something is behaving ideally or not is to look at its uh, plot on a PXY or a TXY diagram. Now keep in mind, we've been using Raoult's law to describe the behavior of uh, mixtures on a TXY or PXY diagram. And since Raoult's law has ideal solution built right into it, we can use it as a basis for comparing when something is ideal or not. So here on this PXY diagram, um, 
I'm going to plot uh, a mixture of A and B. And we're going to say uh, A, it's X sub A, that's on the uh, X axis, X and Y sub A, that's on the X axis. And it goes from concentration of zero all the way to one. And uh, so here is, an, for example, the line that you get describing the behavior of, uh, of the vapor phase. It, it'll be a straight line because when we look at Reynolds' law, Reynolds' law has on the left-hand side yi times p, and that's just that's that's a straight line. There's no curve to that. So always part of a pxy diagram uh, that speaks to the vapor behavior is always a straight line running between the two uh, pure component boiling points. And then you have the behavior of the liquid, xi times pi sat, and that will typically have a little bit of a, of a bow to it. And so that is what an ideal solution, as described by Reynolds' law, will look like on pxy. The corresponding txy, which I have put smaller and next to this, uh, tilts in the opposite direction, right? Because if something boils at a high pressure, that means... Um, you need to exert a high pressure on it to keep it from boiling. So it needs um, a high, uh, it will boil correspondingly then at a low temperature. Does that make sense? Um, think it through in your head for a bit. Things flip sides um, when you're going to from PXY to TXY. So if we have this situation where we have a mixture of A and B and they're not an ideal solution and they're non-ideal in such a way that A and B have highly attractive interactions, much more attractive than the case between A and A or B and B, we get what's called a negative deviation to Reynolds' law. And that dotted line that I drew initially as a straight line, in this case, would kind of swoop down on the PXY diagram. Um, and its shape doesn't have to be like a nice even bow, it could be something that leads to an azeotrope. And then I've redrawn it again over on the TXY side so you can compare. So that's what's called a negative deviation. If the molecules love each other a lot, you get a negative deviation. Um, if A and B are uh, more, if A and B prefer to be with their own kind than with each other, so A is more highly attracted to A and B is more highly attracted to B, than they are to each other, you get what's called a positive deviation from Reynolds' law. And as you might guess, that means that this, the dotted line bows up, goes in the other direction. And on the TXY, uh, you see that it flips down. Okay? And what I've mostly drawn here, I've concentrated on drawing the one line, and now I'm going to go back through and I'm going to fill in the other half of the diagram. So you can imagine the pink dotted line and the pink solid lines go together. Um, and you can see I've hinted at perhaps an azeotrope on the TXY. An azeotrope would appear on both TXY and PXY, so you, you see it in both places. But I'm just giving you an example of, of what they might look like. So uh, you don't always have to have an azeotrope if the solution is not ideal. Uh, however, only non-ideal solutions have azeotropes. And if you think about kind of the, the range of shapes you've seen for TXY and PXY diagrams, you probably have an inkling that there's a lot of stuff that isn't ideal solutions. And uh, in fact, ethanol water, an example that we've considered before and will be considering again, is a nice example of a non-ideal solution that has an azeotrope. In order to cope with a real world that isn't an ideal solution containing world, we need to modify Reynolds' law. And there is a version of Reynolds' law, which isn't even Reynolds' law anymore, that engages with the full complexity of reality. Uh, but we're going to use a, a slightly simplified version that assumes we're close to atmospheric pressure. Your textbook has the full version uh, if you are at higher pressures and need to use that. So. Our problem for today is to use an activity model, and we're going to recalculate that calculation we did just the other day, where we figured out the boiling point for
for a, li a liquid mixture of ethanol and water that was 0.85 mole fraction ethanol. Now, when we did this before, we were assuming that uh, we were uh, using uh, ideal solution. And I'm just telling you, just going to make the case right now and right here, that in fact is not an ideal solution. That's not a good assumption in this case. And so we're going to need to use something that captures this non-ideality. And so we're going to use what's called an activity model. And we're going to use an empirical activity model. And we're going to jump right in and use it, in fact, before I've explained how it works. We'll do that next time. Um, so we're going to use modified Routes Law and this activity model. So Routes Law, we're ahead of Routes Law, no assumptions at all, Fi vapor equals Fi liquid with the little hats on. We're going to assume ideal gas on the vapor side, that's YIP. We are not going to assume ideal solution on the liquid side, but we are going to assume low pressure, which is a good assumption at atmospheric pressure. So our change is it's Xi times gamma I Pi sat. And the gamma I is what's called the activity coefficient. It captures the way in which our, our uh, solution differs from an ideal solution. And I've put a couple of definitions in here for you. So gamma I is uh, the ratio of the fugacity of the stuff in the mixture to how it behaves as a pure component uh, with mole fraction uh, down there on the bottom, and activity itself. This is a very PCHEM thing. Physical chemists love to have a concept and then its coefficient, you know, so you'll have fugacity and fugacity coefficient, activity, activity coefficient. I'm sorry, that's how the world works. So we will both be, we will be using both activity, which is A, the ratio of the pure component fugacity and the fugacity in the mixture, as well as activity coefficient. And activity coefficient goes very nicely into this equation. For an ideal solution, turns out activity coefficient is 1, so it just disappears if we don't need it. We need a mathematical way to express activity coefficient, so we're going to use an empirical model that is relatively easy to use, and we can just plug and chug our way through it. And so I'm writing out, this is what's uh, called the two-parameter Margoules equation. And as I said, it's empirical, so this was derived, its factors, A12 and A21, were derived uh, from a curve fit to experimental data. So this doesn't tell us a whole lot about how the molecules behave or what they do, and uh, we can't use this model to uh, describe all that much um, about the behavior of ethanol and water, except what happens uh, to their equilibrium uh, boiling points and uh, dew points. So that's the equation, and I'm sorry I had to move things around to fit it all in. Uh, so you'll want to pause and write down that equation uh, because you're going to use it in order to calculate your little gammas. And for uh, ethanol being 1 and water being 2, I have worked out uh, the parameters for you. So capital A12 um, and capital A21, their values are appearing on the screen. And so what do you do? Well, you do the same exact thing you did before in applying Routes Law, except now you have an additional set of equations that you've got to work in as you're solving. So let's figure out what this approach tells us the boiling point of this mixture is, and let's compare it to reality and see how it turned out. Okay, thank you.